Well, thank you, Jeff, for that hopeful message. That is a perfect introduction to our text today. Our long walk through the doctrinal section of Romans, that is chapters 1 through 11, comes to a close. If you remember, it began with this rather portentous statement. And that is in Romans 1.18. So he has said, placing your faith in the gospel. The, the, the gospel is apprehended by faith. And then in Romans 1.18, it says the wrath of God. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodless or godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And that's the beginning statement that Paul uses to begin to lay out all of the doctrine that follows. Everything from chapters 1 to all the way up until 11 that we're going to conclude today is Paul laying out his theology. He is laying out all of his doctrinal points, all the things that he says are important about faith in Christ, about God's people and how they are to understand their place in the world, how they are to see themselves in the larger culture, and what God is doing outside of that. So he begins on the perhaps doomiest note that he can. See, God's wrath is being revealed. Against what? Against everything. All the godlessness. All the unrighteousness. Everyone who does not belong to God is beginning to experience God's wrath. And so this is the reality in which we live. This is what the world is. It is fallen. It is troubled. It is challenged. It is whatever word you want to put in there to describe it. And you and I live in the midst of that. And this is, of course, thousands of years back. It is still true today that this is the reality in which we live. And yet he starts on that note at the very bottom. This world is lost. This world is the object of God's wrath. And then he begins to lay out the reality of that world. All fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. All are owed nothing but death. He builds and he builds and he builds. And when we think, when we come to the end of chapter 3, we begin to say to ourselves, there's no hope. There is no hope at all. And yet Paul says, of course there is. Hope's name is Jesus. While you were still sinners, Christ died for you. We're lifting up a little bit. And up a little bit more and up a little bit more until we get to that, that beautiful sort of apogee there at the end of chapter 8. God's working all things. Nothing. Nothing. Not one single thing that you will experience in this world can separate you from that love. Wow. Up, up, up. But then Paul has a secondary concern, doesn't he? He goes, in chapter 9, he dives back down into the doom. He says, listen, let me sidebar for a second. Let me talk about my people, Israel, my people, the Jews. And then he starts over. He said, they brought on themselves a hardening. He has, he has said, but my people, my people Israel, are suffering the same thing. And they brought it on themselves. You see, the Gentiles had an excuse. They didn't know God. God had not selected them out and said, you are my special people, my treasured possession. So the Gentiles, they accidentally stumbled into this by the power of the gospel. But Israel had no excuse. Israel was in a worse condition because they had brought the trouble they're experiencing now on themselves. It was their stiff necks 
that caused God to let their hearts grow harder. Now, Paul says that your hearts are growing harder. And in that hardness of heart, as your hearts have grown harder and harder and harder, your neck stiffer and stiffer. You're completely missing out on what's going on around there. And so for two chapters, he, lay, he lays all of the facts out. He reaches back into the Old Testament again and again and again and again. He says, look, you were told. Look, God sent you a prophet. Look, God gave you this living parable in Hosea, and you didn't get it. You didn't get it one single time. And then you rejected God in the worst possible way. You rejected God by rejecting his son. The Messiah that God sent you crucified. The Christus that God gifted you with, you killed. And so we're thinking he went to doom and stayed in doom. And yet when he comes into chapter 11, it begins to rise and rise quickly. God is using the hardness of Israel for a purpose. Remember, God works all things for good. He's giving an example of it right here. 9 and 10 and 11. He says, look, God is doing this for the good. Because of you, because of you, Israel, because of you, my brothers and sisters, because of you, the Gentiles are being saved. Because of you, the gospel is a reality all throughout the world. Because of you and your hardness of heart, people who were far from God are now God's people. And the Jews that are hearing this are saying, well, that's, that's great for them. What about us? And he's going to reveal the final answer in our passage today. Now, this has taken us weeks and weeks to get through this. And at each point, we've touched on a little more doctrine, a little more theology. And you can, you can sometimes think, why? why? Why is he telling us this? Why do you give us all this theology? Why, what's the point of all of this doctrine that you lay out here? Just tell us how much Jesus loves us. Well, Jesus does love you a lot. But the doctrine that is laid out throughout the scriptures, the doctrine, the theology that is, that is, that is complex sometimes, difficult to grasp, but all of this is laid out not just so that we'll fill our heads with more knowledge, but so that you will realize how much more Jesus loves you than you even imagine. All of our doctrine, every bit of our doctrine should lead us to doxology. At the end of this chapter, at the end of chapter 11, Paul concludes with this statement, this prayer, this praise. You can almost see him lifting his hand as he says this in the very last verse. He says, for from him, and through him and for him are all things. To him, to him be glory forever. All this doctrine, every bit of it from chapter 1 to this point, concludes in that statement. Doctrine should always lead us to doxology. It should always lead us to praise. When we talked about the principles a couple of weeks back where we extract a larger thought and apply it to our life, one of the things we understand throughout, Jesus doesn't teach just so we'll fill our heads and be smart guys. Jesus teaches so we will fall in love, so that we will love him, so that we will realize what an awesome sacrifice is made on our behalf. Paul lays out all this complicated history so that Israel will realize that God has never turned his back on them. They have brought the hardness on themselves. And if they will soften their hearts, if they will be humbled, God is waiting for them. God is waiting for them. So all of this, all of the doctrine, all of the theology, all the principles leads us to praising God. 
The other thing we come to understand throughout all this, and, and it's hard because we break this up over, I don't know, 50 or 60 weeks, however long we've been in this, okay? We break this up, this little part, this little part, this little part, and it's hard to pull it all back together when you could read this book in a half hour, okay? But when we pull it all together, when we take those, those principles, we pull together all the little individual parts, we find out something about our faith, don't we? And that is our faith, Christianity, is not just a bunch of rules. We turn it into that sometimes. Sometimes we like to lay things out and say, if I do this, if I do this, if I don't do this, if I don't do this, all will be well. But you miss the most important component, and that is the relationship. Our, our faith is not just rule after rule after rule after rule. If it was that, we would become rule followers. We would devote all of our energy to rule following. We would test one another and evaluate each other on our rule followership. And Jesus dismissed all of that. He said, it's all in here. It's all in here. Rule followers live up here in their being. Rule followers live in their head, thinking constantly, am I following the rules? Did I break a rule? What can I do about that broken rule? But Christ followers live in here, in here, in their heart. This is where our faith rests. And it doesn't seem like Paul gets that, but he does. He does. It just takes him 11 chapters to lay it all out. He lays out point after point after point and then says, for from him and through him and for him are all things. All that he has laid out in these chapters comes to a single conclusion. It is all about and for and through Jesus Christ. Yes? That is what we have covered up to this point, and that's why at the very end of the book, Paul doesn't give a summary of the rules. He doesn't say, all right, let me, let me just bring all of that together into one rule statement that you can maybe tattoo on your arm and, and think about every day. No, when Paul gets to the end of this, as, as he has laid out reality for the Gentiles, reality for the Jews, he has brought them together and said there is hope upon hope upon hope. He gets to the end and he cannot help himself. He just bursts out in praise. And that's where we begin today. So we're in chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 25 today. So he's going to begin this, this leading up to his doxology. Remember, he has said, Israel, there is hope. There is endless hope for you. There is nothing but hope for you. And he says this. Remember, he's still speaking to the Gentiles. Verse 25, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, and he quotes from Isaiah, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And then he quotes loosely from Jeremiah. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. He says, dear brothers and sisters, and he's speaking to his Gentile, his Christian brothers and sisters. He said, listen, there is nothing but hope for Israel. In fact, you should be even more humbled now that you understand all that he said. The hardening of Israel was for your good. The hardening of Israel was so that you could be saved. Had Israel not been hardened, they would not have crucified the Messiah. Had they not been blinded to who was standing right in front of them, they would have seen the Christ. They would have worshipped him and protect him at all cost. And there never would have been the atonement for sin. So as he speaks to the Gentile, he is just level and serious. This was for your good that Israel was hardened. But, 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 
He says, here's the hope for Israel. Through you, through you Gentiles, through your salvation, through the church, Israel will turn around and be saved. He sees this whole thing as a great huge cycle. Remember what he was talking about in the previous passage. God is using you Gentiles and your faith and the growth of the church and the hope that you have to goad Israel into envy. You're going to make them jealous because what they see, Israel looks at you. They look at you, Christians, and they say, well, they have all the blessings. They have all the hope. They actually know the shalom. And they grow a little envious in their heart. They grow a little jealous and they say, well, you know, I'd like some of that for myself. Aha, there's the opening that God uses. I'd like to be restored to God. I'd like to know my Savior. That's why Paul pulled all those verses from the Old Testament. Here's your hope. Here's your hope. When he pulls this one from Isaiah, he says right there, it says your deliverer is going to come. He's going to take away the transgressions. He's going to forgive your sin. And Israel's, their ear would perk up. And they would, and would say, how? How is this going to happen? Through the new covenant. Through the forgiveness of sins. Through grace. Through mercy in Jesus Christ. He says, there is nothing but hope for you. You are not lost. You are not forever hardened. You are not forever gone. You are God's treasured possession. He's not going to give up on you. You just need to grow humble. And he picks up from there in verse 28. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. Israel is your enemy, Gentile. That's what he's saying. But as far as election is concerned... As far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. God has never denied them. God has never said, you are not my people forever. God has never said any of those things. In fact, God said, Abraham, the, the first, you are holy. You're good. You're my guy. And through you, everybody's going to be blessed. And so he's saying, Gentiles, you need to be humble in the same way that Israel's being humbled because they're going to be saved as well. So verse 29, so, well, let me, let me back up. They are loved on account of the patriarchs. And then verse 29, for God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, the Jews' disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. Paul sees this as a big circle. You're saved, and you're saved so that you can be an example to them. And as they are humbled, they're going to be saved. And then by then, when those, all those branches are brought together, when the wild branches and the healthy branches are grafted onto the root, and everyone is all together, we will collectively be God's people. And he gives that last statement in verse 32, For God has bound everyone over to disobedience, so that he might have mercy on them all. That is the last doctrinal point in this whole long thing from chapter 1 to the end of 11. That is his last point of doctrine. All fall short. Israel had no special favor with God as far as their disobedience. Israel was not automatically redeemed. Israel was not automatically saved. Israel automatically didn't receive all the blessings. 
They as individuals were disobedient. They as individuals had to come to faith in God. And the same thing is true today. So God has used the disobedience of all people for the good of all people. God has wrested disobedience on everybody so that he can have mercy on everybody. Is that an incredible statement or what? Can you believe? Can you believe all the good news that Paul packs in 11 chapters? I know that Romans is an incredibly difficult book, and it, and it has place after place after place that, that, that can be divisive and, and argued over. But if you just read it the way that it's written, if you just read it as is, it is doctrine, theology, and hope from beginning to end. And he takes all that hope, and he's couched it in these difficult little sections, but he's given us nothing but hope, nothing but shalom. And I hope that as difficult as it's been, as hard as it's been to go through all that doctrine, I hope that it gives some peace, some, some hope, some shalom in your life. I know sometimes when we talk theology, it makes your head hurt. Sometimes when we talk about the complexity of what Paul's arguing, it seems kind of arcane and doesn't really apply to our lives. But it applies when we read it in principle, in understanding why he's saying it. For something as simple as the Christian faith, for something as simple as us following Jesus, for us believing, uh, uh, anchoring our faith in the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus, it seems sometimes unnecessarily hard or complex. It seems like we have to devote too much brain power, too much of our energy to understanding what he's saying, to understand what Paul is laying out here, here and any of the other doctrinal books in the Bible. But keep this single principle in mind. None of this is given so that we can become better rule followers. None of this is given so that you and I can lay out a set of rules, wake up, check ourselves against the rules every day. All of this is given so that we will praise God. All doctrine, all theology should lead us to hearts of praise. Not just heads full of knowledge, but hearts of praise. Because at every point whether it's a major or a minor point of doctrine, theology, whatever, at every point, what it should cause us to do is to know God better, to know Him more, to understand Him and His relationship with us to a deeper degree. And in doing so, He doesn't do that to show how awesome He is. We accept that. He does that to show how great His mercy is, how wonderful His grace is, how much he loves us. And so when we talk theology, when we talk doctrine, when we open the Bible and we go through this complicated stuff, it has one point, one outcome, and that is praise. One outcome, and that is us to praise God. Now you can develop this. You can build this up. You can build this up little by little. If you will start, if you will start by just applying yourself to some measure of Bible reading every day, one sentence, one chapter, the whole book of Romans, however you want to do it, just sit down and absorb something of God into your soul every day. When you do this, when you do this, don't sit there and, and pour over the doctrine that you're reading. Just get that into you and let the Holy Spirit use it. Let the Holy Spirit work over in you, in your soul, that bit of scripture that you read each day. That's your starting point. Start there. Get some scripture into you each day. Then, then if you will take and commit yourself to a regular course of Bible reading and prayer, look what the Holy Spirit can do. The Holy Spirit, now, as you pray, as the Holy Spirit moves with you in prayer, as the Holy Spirit speaks 
as God uses the Spirit to communicate to you, as He does that, He can say, this is what this means to you. This is an example of my grace, of my mercy, of my love. This is what I want for you. This is why this way is superior for you. And all you're doing is reading the Bible and praying. If you'll just do those two things, you will praise. If you will do those two things on a regular basis, you will have a heart of praise like you can't believe. But look at this. Look at this. If you'll devote yourself to a regular course of Bible reading, a regular time of prayer, however long that is, if you'll do that, and then you will add your voices to corporate prayer, something whole new will open up for you. You will begin to see how God not just is using you, not just works in you, but works in his entire church. You see, that's why we pray together. Yes, we could all say at 7 p.m. on Wednesday night, we'll all sit in our Barca lounger and pray together, but there's something that happens when we pray together, when we hear one another's voices. The Spirit being present with us, God resting on us when we do that can move us together as we hear one another pray, as we hear one another's heart being poured out, as we hear what the Spirit is doing, what God is doing, what kind of things God is bringing up us. When we hear all that, our perspective on things opens up from just me and my life to us and our life, the church as a whole. Bible reading, prayer, corporate prayer. And there's more. There's more. If you will commit yourself to some measure of Bible reading, to some time in prayer, to adding your voice to corporate prayer, and then committing yourself to worship, to the worship of God on Sunday, everything that you read in the Bible, everything in the book of Numbers, everything in Nahum, everything will open up to you and will be a source of praise for God. Everything. Everything that God reveals. Because what God is doing in the Bible is not giving us a rule book. He's giving us the nature of our relationship to Him. He's saying, this is the world that you're in. This is why it's in this condition. This is what I'm doing. And as you read the different parts of it, the Old Testament, the New Testament, even if you read all the horrors of Revelation, what does it say at the end? That one day the skies will open up, the new heavens and the new earth will descend, and all God's people, all God's people, Christian, Jew alike, all God's people, will be together for eternity with Him. So from chapter 3 of Genesis, where somebody trips and falls all the way to the end of Revelation, where God says, I've got this. It is nothing but hope, increasing hope, overabundance of hope. It is hope upon hope upon hope. And so Paul has laid that out for 11 chapters. He's given you his doctrine. He said, this is it. Everybody has fallen and everybody can have hope. And on that last note, when he says that last thing, this is where he bursts out in song. Listen to what he says in verse 33. Oh, the depths of riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? He is just on top, on top, on top, on top, getting louder and louder. Who understands this mystery? Not how great is this mystery that it's beyond our understanding. Oh, how awesome is this that God is doing, that God has revealed over the course of all these chapters. There's hope for everybody. There's hope for the Gentiles being saved. There is hope for Israel. There's hope for everybody. God's grace is just beyond imagining. Oh, how great a mystery that he has revealed to us. 
God is working all things for good. Indeed, God is working all things for good. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. We don't know what God is going to do. We don't know what he's going to do five minutes from now. But it doesn't matter because we are people of hope. God could end it all before we get to Luby's today and we would still have hope. No matter what trouble we face tomorrow, no matter how difficult the course is that God lays out for your life and my life, it doesn't matter because we have hope at the end of it. Because God has done this. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Not me, not you, none of us. God did this all himself. God did this all by his design. Who has been God's counselor? Who suggested such an awesome thing? Not me, not you. God himself did all of this. Who has ever given to God that he owes them anything? Who owes nobody? God owes us nothing. Agreed? God owes us nada. And yet he gives us everything. He gives us life. And on that note, he says, for from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen?